uh, Dr. Mincher, thank you, Dr. Quinn, uh, thank you, Dr. Dillard, and others who are a part of this uh, brain health series. Certainly want to welcome uh, some of our friends from the St. Luke AME Church, uh, I believe in Harlem. Um, we are really appreciative to all of you who are participating and taking part in this much needed uh, seminar. Uh, Dr. Mensa, thank you for your commitment, your dedication. Uh, thank you for the sacrifices that, that you've made. Uh, you and Dr. Quinn, you all have uh, teamed up and become a dynamic duo. And uh, I appreciatively applaud you all uh, for your uh, extensive research, uh, because we know that in the uh, African American community in particular, uh, that uh, our community members are sometimes devastated and decimated uh, by brain health injuries and and things associated with uh, brain health, such as strokes and uh, Parkinson's, and so. Uh, I was I was grateful for the invitation uh, to be a part of this. Uh, my organization that I had, Impact, mobilizing preachers and communities and those who have participated in previous uh, seminars and webinars, we are uh, grateful for the opportunity to have gleaned uh, from the scholars um, that have participated in all of the contributions that have been made by those of you who are uh, constantly engaging in research and doing everything, humanly speaking, to ascertain uh, information so you can better uh, treat uh, 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 these brain health uh, injuries and, and um, things that are associated uh, with brain health. So God bless you. Thank you. I'm excited about gleaning again today. And I know that uh, we have a phenomenal presenter. Uh, today and uh, let's let's get to work. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, I would like to introduce my a friend, dear friend and colleague, Dr. Erica Dillard. She is a medical doctor, physician by trade, also a um, a doctor philosophy trained uh, neurosurgeon who is now in the process of creating innovative tools for successful neurosurgery. And I am so honored to know her. She went to medical school in um, University of Memphis. She also went to Vanderbilt University undergrad, which is where we met. She was my college roommate. And I'm so grateful that um, she actually pulled me into neuroscience as a, a undergraduate and look at here we are today. So I turn it over to her. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Dillard, and for to hearing your talk. Dr. Mrs. she's also a Delta. She is, excuse me, she is. You're actually correct, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, thank you, I appreciate the introduction and um, Thank you, Nia. Thank you, uh, Kasui. Um, thank you to Teachers College of Columbia as well, um, Dr. Quinn, who I've spoken to a couple of times already as well. I really appreciate this opportunity to just have um, a platform to talk to our community about something that affects them um, so prevalently. <clears throat> and in a time when we're really um, uncovering a lot of healthcare disparities with different populations, I think it's important to make sure that we have a, a way to spread the word and reach um, our community um, on a, a way that they are able to understand the information as well, because everybody is in the healthcare professional. Um, and I think that it's important for us to be able to communicate efficiently to those that we're trying to um, help. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, as Nia said, I have a background in neurosurgery. Um, I'm not currently doing anything clinical. I'm doing something a little bit more business-based right now. But in the capacity of my training, um, I was able to work really closely with multidisciplinary teams to manage uh, patients that suffer from stroke in the acute setting. And so 
Um, as many of you know, over the past several decades, stroke has really started to emerge as a disease that's treatable, not just by medications, but also by surgery. So um, I'd like to talk to you. Go ahead and jump into my discussion. So the purpose of this, the discussion for me is not just to serve as a review just um, of how to recognize stroke, but I want everyone to really leave this discussion having a good solid understanding of several key points. Um, and as such, I wanna make sure you, um, you leave today feeling comfortable with a definition of what stroke is and also what it um, might not necessarily be as well. Um, I wanna make sure that you understand what um, the major causes of stroke are and are able to um, identify signs as well as articulate symptoms that you might have that might point towards a stroke and relate it to its underlying pathophysiology. Um, I want lastly to really talk about the major, <clears throat> excuse me, components of stroke management, which includes the initial workup, as well as <clears throat> the medical and surgical treatments that you might um, come across uh, as a patient who has stroke or maybe one of your family members who um, experiences stroke. And also to touch on a little bit about what follow-up care looks like for a patient who goes through stroke. So, because this whole thing is a navigation, it's a navigation of the healthcare system. And I think that um, some of those um, at least general points are really important for patients to understand what they um, need to look for and questions that they need to ask when they're put in the position um, of being a patient that might be having a stroke. So, <clears throat> As I said, um, what uh, the definition of a stroke is, is, is really mainly the death of brain tissue that's caused by a lack of oxygen um, to that part of the brain. So um, when we talk about oxygen, the oxygen we breathe in is carried in our blood and it's delivered to various parts of the body by way of your arteries. So it's a disease of blood vessels. Um, therefore, stroke, um, it's predominantly a disease of the arteries, not necessarily of the, vein, the veins, but the veins can cause stroke. It's a much rarer cause, cause of stroke, but it is possible. Um, but for our, for our purpose, purposes, we'll be talking specifically about arterial disease that causes stroke. Also, let me know if my internet starts getting a little bit shaky, because if it does, I might have to turn the camera off. It, it's, it does that from time to time, so sorry. Um, so the major arteries that leave the heart and travel to deliver oxygen to the brain are called the carotid arteries. And they lay on both sides of your neck here. Um, and also your vertebral, vertebral arteries that travel along your spinal column in the back of your neck to supply blood to the back of your brain. You may have heard the terms brain attack or excuse me, <clears throat> You may have heard of the terms brain attack or a more technical term, which is brain ischemia, um, which are other ways that you might describe a stroke. Um, or you may have even heard of a CVA or cerebrovascular accident, which is another technical term for stroke as well. A stroke should uh, not necessarily be confused with what you might have heard as a mini stroke or a TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack. Um, these terms, while by definition aren't necessarily death of brain tissue due to a lack of oxygen, but they serve as warning signs that an actual stroke or a major stroke might actually be um, about to occur. So um, by definition, we kind of class, classify them as a subset of, um, of, of stroke syndromes. Um, but they are meant to be taken quite seriously because, as I said before, when someone uh, experiences a mini stroke or a TIA, it's very important to, to have medical attention to understand what's causing that because it can very well lead to a major stroke. So I am <laughs> I'm quite a visual learner. So I wanted to provide an illustration that could highlight the two major types of stroke. So and, and yes, this is, um, this is me in the slide. I just wanted to kind of lighten the mood. Um, as you, if you know anything about me, I don't take myself too seriously. So I think it's <laughs> kind of funny to add myself to the slide, but um, an ischemic stroke occurs due to loss of blood flow to the brain due to an obstruction in the artery. And you can think of this as uh, similar to when you're trying to take a sip of say freshly squeezed juice for the most part, when you suck on the straw, 
juice flows from the bottom of the straw to your mouth. There may be a time when you're trying to take a sip of the, the juice and um, a seed might actually get lodged into the straw, preventing juice from being able to pass through the straw to your mouth. So this prevents any flow of the juice from the bottom to the top, which can be quite frustrating for you um, if you're trying to take a drink of the juice. So in terms of a stroke, this can illustrate how brain tissue um, is when it's without oxygen um, can actually have a decrease in blood flow that that, that part of the brain uh, receives that can cause an ischemic stroke. A less common type of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, this is one that is due to bleeding from a weakened <clears throat> from a weakening in the blood vessel of the brain, which accounts for about 15% of stroke. And in this animation, you'll see that there is an, there's no obstruction, but rather a tear in the straw, which allows leaking of the juice before it actually reaches your mouth. So the outcome is still the same. The juice does not reach where it's trying to go. And in terms of brain tissue, the blood does not reach its destination of that area of the brain, therefore causing injury due to a lack of oxygen. A hemorrhagic stroke is typically caused um, by several uh, other additional factors. One of the most common is high blood pressure. But in addition to this, there are patients who are on blood thinners, um, such as warfarin, you might have heard before, heparin. These blood thinners will increase a patient's risk of having bleeding in the brain. Other types of um, other risk factors that in, uh, include abnormal abnormalities in the blood vessels. Um, you may have heard of an aneurysm, which is just a ballooning of one of the blood vessels, a weakening part in the blood vessel that can actually burst, um, causing blood to leak out of the, of the vessel and cause a hemorrhagic stroke. In addition, um, arterial venous malformations um, are, are a different type of malformation that people may be born with that can also, excuse me, cause um, hemorrhagic strokes. Um, again, as I said, I'm visual. So just to drive home the point, um, just as the seed was lodged in the straw, as we look, as we saw in the previous illustration, a blood clot can travel from another location in the body through the arteries where it becomes lodged and is unable to pass through, causing a loss of blood flow above it. These types of clots are called emboli. And usually they can travel from the heart due to an abnormal heart rhythm, um, such as AFib. Um, you may have a family member or yourself have AFib. Another mechanism is when blood is pinched off due to a localized narrowing of the vessel, which might be due to a plaque buildup. That over time can decrease blood flow uh, in the vessel, which might be due, uh, I'm sorry, which is also con uh, considered atherosclerosis, which is another term you may have heard of. Um, and another way is by compression from the outside of the vessel such as when a tumor grows and starts to become bigger and narrows or pushes on the blood vessel, causing a decrease in blood flow at that point. These two last examples um, of narrowing is what we uh, refer to as stenosis. Um, and you may have heard the term carotid stenosis or carotid disease as a risk factor for stroke. So to kind of put the burden of stroke in a little bit more of a perspective, um, I wanted to provide a few statistics. So about 800,000 Americans each year will have a stroke. And that means that every 40 seconds, someone in the United States is having a stroke. Of these patients, 142,000 in the United States will die from having a stroke. And again, it's, you know, this is really high rate of death. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. One out of 20 um, deaths are due to stroke. And that highest mortality is actually seen in our African-American population. <clears throat> Every four minutes, someone can die from a stroke. It is a major cause of disability. And a lot of patients who um, end up having a stroke will often, oftentimes need long-term care. Um, a lot of times due to decreased independence and mobility. So this, not only the initial event, costs uh, a lot of money in terms of healthcare dollars, but it also has this extreme effect down the line on the patient's um, care and, a, and ability to do things for themselves afterwards. So it's not just that inciting event, it's actually long-term. 
uh, complications as well. And so this cost, this ends up costing our um, us in healthcare associated costs a year, about $34 billion, which is a lot of money. So this is a huge problem, both financially for our healthcare, healthcare system. It's a huge burden on us um, as individuals. We, If we haven't had a stroke before, we know someone and maybe multiple people who have had a stroke. So it's a huge problem. In terms of risk factors, so I want to just kind of distinguish a little bit between what we call modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable risk factors are the ones that you really can't do anything about. They are what they are. Um, in terms of age, all of us are getting older, none of us are getting younger. And as we continue to age, our risk for stroke will continue to get higher. In fact, each decade between 55 and 85, your risk of stroke will double. In terms of gender, men typically have a higher risk than women at younger ages. However, as we continue to get older, that risk uh, tends to plateau between the two, uh, between sexes. And women actually do die from stroke. Um, at a much higher rate than men, unfortunately. Um, as we said, race and ethnicity is another factor that is non-modifiable. You have your hand up, Nia? Why do women die more than men from stroke? Do we know why that is? Um, it's it's a probably multifactorial. I, don't, I think um, that uh, it could be, again, some of the things that we talk about in terms of um, healthcare disparities. It also could be the increase um, uh, in terms of our changes in, in heart disease, because again, that's another one that kind of changes as we get older as well, is our, is our um, mortality rate from heart disease too. So I think it's, it's kind of multifactorial. There's, um, I, I don't think there's one thing that really points towards why that is. Um, and, and if anyone else on the call actually has um, a uh, opinion about that as well, please definitely put, jump in. And I wanna make sure that everybody, this is a discussion. So let's, I want everybody to feel comfortable with, with jumping in. Um, I know we have a lot of people with um, backgrounds in neurology as well. So I would love to kind of hear your opinion about that, but I think it's just, it's multifactorial and, and um, I'm not sure if there's one really main reason why, but Again, just as race and ethnicity, healthcare disparities that are unassociated with anything um, medically risk, medical risk factors, maybe socioeconomic and things of that nature, actually influence why the outcomes are worse for for men could also be the case for women as well. Um, and then one of the other non modifiable risk factors we talk about are family history and genetics. And so I actually put an asterisk next to this because it's a continuum. As we continue to find new therapies that are um, that address genetic disorders, um, this becomes a little bit more fluid. A lot of times we're able to um, identify a patient who has a genetic disease and treat them accordingly earlier, change um, their behaviors or modifiable environmental risk factors that can actually decrease their risk of developing a stroke in the long term. In terms of modifiable risk factors, um, your typical ones that we think about hypertension, heart disease, again, we talked about AFib earlier, high cholesterol, diabetes, all of these things are modifiable in that if we are able to change um, uh, our, our behavior in terms of diabetes, our diet, weight loss for obesity, things of that nature, we will also see a decrease in our risk of developing a stroke in the long term. So um, at this point, I, I want to make sure just to say that I hope that we all have a good working definition of what stroke what stroke is and what the common risk factors, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors are, is, as well as what the impact stroke has on the healthcare system. Next, I wanna start jumping into what, what you may have thought this, the full talk was about, which is signs and symptoms of, of a stroke. And um, in terms of this, there are two categories I like to kind of like gently make a distinction between. And those are constitutional symptoms versus what we consider localized or specific signs and symptoms of stroke. And so constitutional symptoms, we call them that because these are symptoms that are kind of nonspecific. They could be attributed to a number of things, a headache. A headache could be due to a migraine. A headache could be due to 
having an infection, having the flu, confusion and dizziness. These are all things that are not specific to a stroke. However, when you couple these symptoms with your localized symptoms, such as an increased, um, I'm sorry, such as numbness and weakness on one side of the body, vision changes, loss of coordination. When you couple those things, your increase in your suspicion for stroke should be heightened. And so um, in addition to numbness, we think about weakness maybe on one side of the body versus the other. Um, one term that you may have heard, which has been a big campaign with the CDC and the American Heart Association is the FAST campaign. It's an acronym that actually stands for um, something in terms of the signs that are most commonly observed when a patient may be having a stroke. So for instance, uh, the first letter in the acronym is F, which stands for facial droop, face or facial droop. Um, and when a, a lot of times this may be the first sign that you actually notice about a person if they're having a stroke. And in order to detect whether or not a person is having a facial droop, you can ask, just simply ask the person to, to, uh, to give you a smile. And a lot of times you might notice an asymmetry in one side of the face versus the other. The next um, letter stand, uh, A stands for <clears throat> arm. So you can ask the person to raise both of their arms in the air. And notice, does one of the arms drift down or are they even able to lift that arm at all? And next you wanna to listen to a person's speech. So is their speech clear, um, but it seems like they're kind of talking gibberish or having some confusion in their speech or are they able to construct actual normal sentences, but they have a slurred speech. And maybe the patient is not able or the person is not able to even form words at all. There is a spectrum, a range of what speech deficits might look like. But it should be noted, if you notice any type of abnormalities in a person's speech acutely, that this could be concerning for the person developing a stroke. And the likelihood, if you notice any of these symptoms are um, of them actually having a stroke is 70 to uh, increase 72% with any one of these symptoms. And so if these symptoms are noticed, um, it's an emergency and you should be taking heed to um, the last letter in FAST, which stands for time. If you see these symptoms, if you notice these symptoms in yourself, do not waste time. You need to call 911 immediately because it is a medical emergency if someone is having a stroke. So I wanna quickly um, show you a video that will kind of put in perspective <clears throat> the signs of stroke that we've been talking about and in particular show you how these signs when you recognize them can actually help determine what type of stroke a person is having, um, even without doing any type of like sophisticated studies, imaging studies. So just by taking information from the person's exam, um, you might be able to pinpoint where in the brain is being affected by the stroke. So um, uh, one of the other things in terms of the pathophysiology of the stroke is that one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. So if you have a patient who's having, um, who might be having a stroke on the right side of the brain, that's going to affect the control of their sensation and their motor on the left side of the body. So um, I'm gonna jump into the video so you can kind of understand what I'm saying here. So this patient, you asked them to raise their left arm, able to do that without a problem. When you ask them to raise their right arm, they are unable to do that even with great effort. They still can't lift that arm. When the, you ask them to raise the left leg, no problems. But when you ask them to raise the right, they struggle to try to even get the right leg off of the bed, as you can see here. With great effort, it's very difficult for them to even raise that leg off of the bed. <clears throat> In terms of a sense, sensory exam, when you touch the patient on the left arm, they'll jump because they feel that. And also for the left leg, but when you actually press on the right arm, they don't feel the sensation. So they don't make any movements to acknowledge that you've touched them there. Again, when you ask the patient to smile, you see that there's an asymmetry. The left side looks like a smile while the, white ha the right has a droop. If you ask them to raise their eyebrows, both eyebrows are able to raise. So stroke, um, 
being that it's a problem in the brain actually affects the lower side of the face. So you will see asymmetry on one side of the face while not on the other, or, or, or ability to smile on one versus the other. But the eyebrows can still move up and down both at the same time. So this is very indicative of a stroke that might be concerning for a left side um, occlusion or obstruction. Um, I just wanted to show this picture also, not to, um, to get too technical, but so that those who have never seen blood vessels, what they look like in the brain, this is a, what we call a cerebral angiogram. And this study is done by a specialist, like a radiologist, neurologist, or a neurosurgeon, who will be able to uh, put a little small wire, kind of wire-sized catheter into the arteries. It can go in the arm or in the leg. And they'll thread that catheter all the way up to where the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain are. And once they get to that location, they'll squirt a little bit of dye into those, into those arteries. And as they squirt the dye into the arteries, they can take a 3D image all the way around the brain to look at those blood vessels. And what you see in this image is that the non-technical term, you see a lot of squiggly lines over here on the right-hand side of the brain. Those little um, squiggly lines are all blood vessels that supply the right side of the brain. So when that image is taken, this really lights up on the right. You can see all those blood vessels. That part of the brain is getting sufficient blood flow. If you compare that to the left side of the brain, there is an obstruction here. So you don't see those blood vessels light up over here. This is very classic um, example of a left MCA obstruction or middle cerebral artery obstruction here. So that part of the brain isn't getting blood. And so you see these symptoms that manifest on the right side of the body of this patient. Very, very um, uh, classic example. So um, moving on just to kind of understand what you need to do now. So now that you've, you've found out, I have this exam, I'm starting to have these symptoms. I'm very concerned that I might be having a stroke. What do you do? You have to act fast. The best outcomes for patients occur when they get to medical, medical care very quickly, typically within three hours of the symptoms occurring. So as soon as you recognize these symptoms, you need to call for help immediately. If you are having symptoms or are with someone who can help you, have them call 911. And if you're alone, you try to get to the phone to call 911 yourself. But one thing that I think is uh, key to remember too is that people who have you know, stroke symptoms, say they have weakness or they can't feel one side of their body, are very prone to falls and injury, secondary to the stroke. So one thing that I always say too is that if you feel that you're having this coming on, try not to be on your feet a lot because you don't recognize it but then you stand up all of a sudden, those patients fall, they'll hit, they'll hit their head on different part, you know, different furniture in the room. I've seen it so many different times. So it's one thing to just be aware of, be very cautious. If you have to get up and move around, be aware that one side of your body may actually not be working or functioning properly and that you're at increased risk of falling. And so once you make that phone call to um, emergency, who, uh, do you expect is going to be taking care of you? So if you've never been in this situation, I just want to give you an update, kind of like, who are these people that are going to be coming in and touching you and asking you questions? Your first line of defense is going to be the emergency team. So once you call the am call for an ambulance, the first uh, healthcare professionals that you'll see are your EME EMS, your paramedics. And those paramedics, are actually highly trained in recognizing different types of issues, pathologies, very highly trained in being able to recognize stroke. So they will be the first ones to have an inclination that you may be having a stroke and they will communicate that to your ER physician where you're getting in the ambulance to go. So it's really important to get those people on board very early. Try not to take matters into your own hands and have someone drive you which is gonna be stuck in traffic and all that. Make sure that you have a professional from the very beginning of a concern for a stroke. Once you get to the hospital in the emergency room, the first physician that you'll probably come in contact with is your emergency room physician. And that physician will be able to assess you as well. They may do um, a certain score to determine what your level of severity is in terms of your, um, how highly um, at risk you are for a stroke. 
And that person is the person that's the key contact for alerting all the other healthcare professionals that will be um, involved in your care. Specifically, if there's a concern that you're having a stroke, there may be a stroke team that is called. That stroke team is made up of neurologists, sometimes a neurosurgeon, depending on the resources and level of care that hospital is able to provide. And so just so you know, when you're looking around and you see these people coming towards you, a lot of them will be, one will be your ER physician and you will probably have a neurologist and even a neurosurgeon to come and assess you and ask you questions. You may feel it's redundant, but understand it is very important that these people assess you appropriately because they're the ones that are going to take it to the next level if you qualify for any type of treatment. So very important to understand that. So in terms of um, what those healthcare professionals are required to do for you. So um, typically when your stroke team, a neurologist and neurosurgeon is involved, they, they try to uh, follow what is called a stroke protocol. And I'm not gonna get into detail about this. What you see at the very top from five to 45 to 60 is time and minutes. And so when those team members are called, their main goal is to get you the appropriate treatment in the least amount of time possible because time is brain. So the longer out you are from when your symptoms started, the harder it is to get you to a, a optimal outcome to regain function. And so there are certain medications or certain treatments that you might not even qualify for the longer out from the start of your symptoms. So it's very, very important to just look at this and assess and see there are things from five minutes to, to one hour that have to get done in order to get you the appropriate treatment. You start with the stroke alert call to the stroke team. We already discussed that. Everybody has to come in and assess you. They'll get a physical exam. Another thing that they have to do is get a history from you. They need to understand when you were last seen normal, when your, your symptoms started. <clears throat> The problem sometimes you'll run into is if the patient is having difficulty with speech or if it's you and you can't articulate when things happen, what your medical history is. And so it was also important for um, the, the physician to be in contact with the EMS because EMS or paramedics may have talked to the family who was around. They may have the contact information. So just be aware that the symptoms of stroke can actually hinder what information you can provide to the healthcare provider to help in your management. An NIH stroke scale is something else that will probably be done by a professional. And it's basically a score of zero to 42 in which um, you're able to gauge the severity of what the, what the stroke is. And so that gives you a, a gauge of what types of outcomes that patient may have, especially if they don't receive care. And so the NIH stroke scale is something else that's utilized by the healthcare professionals in that setting. The next thing that needs to be done in 15 to 20 minutes is any types of studies that need to be done to A, look at your blood to see if there might be a clotting problem. Are you on blood thinners? How thin is your blood? That also determines whether or not you can get further management such as a clot buster. They'll look at a CT scan of your brain one of the main reasons to do that is to just determine this is, this is a stroke. I'm concerned that this is a stroke, but it also could be a brain tumor. It also could be a bleed. And understand if you have blood in your brain, it's treated quite differently than an ischemic stroke. So these things are all done to ensure that you get the appropriate care. Um, so this is just laid out just for you to understand that within an hour, the push is that you are able to get the appropriate treatment that you need once you hit the door, okay? <clears throat> so again, in terms of your treatment plan, this is really, um, I don't, I'm not gonna get into the minutia of what the treatment plan actually is, but I just wanted to kind of lay or drive home the point that what treatment you qualify for is really largely dependent on how long it's been since your onset of symptoms, right? So another way of saying this is when your last seen normal, which is sometimes you might hear LSN, your last seen normal time. And depending on this answer, there are two pathways that can be taken. If symptoms have occurred in less than four to four and a half hours, you might be eligible for a clot buster which I talked about a little bit briefly earlier, which is TPA. You may have heard that before. Um, 
However, the further out from symptoms, the less likely that this clot buster is going to work for you. And so after four hours or so of having your first symptoms, the risk of the treatment, such as bleeding, might actually outweigh your benefits. Does anybody have a question? Oh, okay, somebody's, I think somebody's microphone just turned on. Um, so also based on the imaging studies that you might have done or have completed, the location of the clot can be confirmed. And a more sophisticated study may have been um, may have been done that can show how much brain tissue has been affected by the stroke and if there is um, any brain that can be salvaged or saved by using a clot buster. If there is still a clot present even after you have a clot buster, you may be um, eligible for having a surgical procedure done, which will, um, which, excuse me, here we go, which um, is called in, uh, an intervention or surgical treatment that can actually remove the clot from the artery so that it can restore blood flow to that area of the brain. So the point here again um, is time is brain. Your timing from when you have the onset of symptoms will dictate what type of treatments you will be eligible for. So the point is call emergency as soon as you have an inclination that someone with you or yourself is having a stroke, any of those symptoms that we discussed before. Um, and again, not everyone is actually, unfortunately, eligible or qualifies for treatment, as we discussed. So um, the important thing is to, you know, understand what the risk factors are for a patient as well, um, because you don't want to cause more complications by trying to treat someone um, than not treating them. So transparency and communication on the side of your healthcare professional is really, really important with the patient and with a family member so they can make a very clear and informed decision about what steps they are willing to take, what risks they are willing to take to see if they can get better from uh, a stroke and the treatments that they, they can be provided at that time. So that's what's key. So, um, uh, Nearing the end here, it's important to understand that after you experience a stroke, especially if you receive some sort of treatment, like we were talking about a clot buster or sur and or surgery, um, you're not out of the clear. And in fact, almost always a patient will have to be admitted to the hospital for further workup to continue their monitoring um, and specifically to really look for any type of post-operative complications if they had surgery. Um, in, in terms of if there's a change in that patient's exam that might alert that something else is going on. High risk of, ha of having another stroke after the first stroke. So you wanna monitor for that. You, all, you wanna monitor that whatever treatments you gave the patient that you didn't cause any side effects or adverse effects that could also have an effect on the patient's outcomes as well. So all of these things, a lot of times that patient will go to an intensive care unit at least for 24 hours outside of having um, some kind of treatment. So also, um, depending on the patient's size of their stroke, the underlying brain tissue is actually um, very, very susceptible to swelling. So any, if you punch your arm and it's damaged there, you get a swelling. Your brain is the same way. You can get swelling in the brain when you have damage to it. And sometimes that swelling can be very, very severe requiring certain medications to be given. It has to be given in a ICU setting. Um, and even worse, sometimes that swelling does not respond to medication and you have to have a surgery to actually release the pressure on the brain. So there, the point here is that so when you have an acute um, and you're in the acute setting and you have a stroke, don't think you're going home the next day. This is a life changing event. And this is something that has to be very closely monitored, especially within the first day or two after, after the surgery. I mean, I'm sorry, after the stroke. And especially if you have treatment, you have to monitor that patient to make sure that the treatments you gave them don't um, have any complications associated with them as well. Another thing is that you will probably require more imaging. So an MRI is a scan that can be done to look at the extent of the stroke and to, to, uh, to determine whether or not the brain that you were trying to protect to prevent a stroke from happening in, you were able to do that. So an MRI within a certain amount of time will actually show you that information. You'll also probably get another CT scan to make sure that there's no bleeding in the brain. Um, all of these things will be done typically within the hospital set, within that visit. 
You also wanna do additional studies to determine what your risk factors are um, that had caused the stroke in the first place. Sometimes we know what those are. Sometimes the patient has already had a stroke and so they've had a pretty extensive workup, but sometimes this is the first time they've had a stroke and they don't know what their underlying reasons for having a stroke are. So in those cases, workup might include doing a carotid ultrasound to look at those arteries that supply blood to the brain to determine if there's any disease that might be causing those strokes. The other thing is, is it due to the heart? Does this patient have some kind of heart abnormality that they don't know about or some kind of underlying um, cardiac arrhythmia such as AFib? So maybe the patient might need to have some type of heart monitoring over several days to weeks sometimes. So these are all things that will have to be done in order to gauge what that person's causes, underlying causes for that, that stroke was. The last thing in terms of stroke care is that, again, we talked about multi, multidisciplinary teams. You will have a team of specialists on board for you once you have a stroke. And it's very important to have the knowledge and expertise of these specialists because stroke care is multifaceted. And so once you have a stroke, typically you will at least have a cardiologist, maybe a cardiologist, definitely a neurologist on board to make recommendations. And one of the things they're going to do is take a look at your medications. And they need to understand, say, for instance, a patient is on blood thinners and they still had a stroke. Why did they have a stroke when they're on blood thinners? Maybe their medications need to be adjusted. Most of the time when a patient has a stroke, they may have to start on aspirin. What if that patient was already on aspirin and they still had a stroke through that? So maybe those medications need to be adjusted. So these are all things that really have to be worked out in order to do what we're trying to do, which is prevent any further stroke and to make sure that you have the best outcomes possible. So lastly, um, just talking about um, uh, what after hospital admission for a stroke, after you leave that hospital, you will need close follow-up. And often you'll probably need long-term management for, for your care. Life after a stroke is, is not easy. It's not going to be simple. And it actually requires a lot of patience on the part of the, the survivor of the stroke and the family members or caretakers. It's not a quick process. So it's important that you have to remember to communicate these as a healthcare professional, to communicate these things efficiently to the patient and to the families so they won't have unrealistic goals about their outcomes and about their goals of care. If a patient has, for instance, persistent neurological deficits several weeks or you know, a week or two outside of having the initial stroke, um, such as weakness or difficulty with speech after a stroke, it's really difficult to predict when they're going to have a return of function. So the goals should be focused on giving that patient the best chance at doing, um, at, at, at doing that to achieve the best quality of life in the process, and also to decrease the chances of having another stroke, as I said before. So the healthcare team start, comes into play here. The healthcare team is gonna be vital to the long-term management of each patient and likely will consist, to, uh, consist of some or all of the following of those that you see here. A neurologist, if you had surgical management for the stroke this time around, you'll probably have a neurosurgeon on board. You'll probably have a cardiologist if something was found on those studies after the fact that show that you have an abnormality in your heart or you have AFib or something like that, you'll have a cardiologist manage you. You'll have to make sure that your PCP, your normal doctor is aware of what happened to you because that person is involved in your care on all other aspects of what other medical problems you have. You wanna make sure PT, occupational therapy, speech therapy are involved super important at this stage because what we're saying, one of the goals of care is to achieve your best quality of life after having a, a stroke. And the people that will help you do this is not your neurosurgeon or your neuro, it's gonna be your physical therapist, your occupational therapist and your speech therapist. You may receive therapy in an inpatient setting. It may be in an outpatient setting. You may have to, depending on your level of independence after the stroke or even before the stroke, you may end up in a long-term care facility but even in those settings, you, you will probably have access to these type of therapists that will help you along the way. So they're very vital in your, in your healthcare team after having a stroke. Psychiatry might be involved. Again, this is a life-changing event. So a lot of patients will have some kind of maybe mood disorder, maybe a little bit of depression. It's important 
to not um, make a stigma out of this and make sure that they have that additional care as well. And pain management, sometimes patients will have a pain syndrome from having a stroke on one side of the brain. So pain management might be involved. And last but not least, we have to remember that the patient and the family and caregiver are part of the healthcare team and any decisions that are made in order to achieve best quality of life, they have to be on board with what the plan is. So that is the culmination of my talk. Um, I want to just really quickly, this is a quiz. <laughs> it's not for any, anything in particular, but I just want to gauge everybody's understanding of what we talked about today. And so you should be able to, Nia, do they have the ability to do um, like a hand raise? Yes, that should be in the reactions. If you guys <laughs> um, go to the reaction feature, you should be able to see um, yes, no, <laughs> faster, hand clap, thumbs up, heart, joy. So we're gonna use a thumbs up. Okay, thumbs, thumbs up there. So this is the case of Mildred, okay? Mildred is a 67 year old woman. She has diabetes and had breast cancer that was treated with chemo radiation surgery and is now in remission for that. She lives with her son and his wife since her cancer diagnosis. One hour ago, while she's watching television, she developed a headache, followed by sudden numbness of her right arm and slurred speech lasting about five minutes, and then it completely resolved. 20 minutes later, her symptoms return and have been present and consistent for at least 15 minutes without going away. She attempts to walk to the restroom, but notices now, in addition to having the slurred speech and the numbness, she now has some weakness that's developed in the right arm and the leg. Questions. Do you think Mildred is having a stroke? Give me a thumbs up if you think so. Okay. Do you think that this is a medical emergency? I should nod my head because I'm giving you the answers. <laughs> so what do you think Mildred should do first? If you think she should A, take a nap, raise your, raise your thumbs. If you think she should call 911, raise your thumbs. Do you think she should walk to a neighbor's house? <laughs> Lastly, or actually second to last question, what does FAST stand for? Is it A, face, ankle, sight, time? Is it B, forehead, arm, speech, touch? Or is it C, face, arm, speech, time? Very good. Last question. Did Mildred have any of the signs or symptoms of FAST? What do you think? Yes, thumbs up. Absolutely. So do I think that Mildred is having a stroke? I absolutely do. I think that she had a TIA that, re that lasted for five minutes and resolved. And then she had another event that ended up sticking around for more than five minutes and had additional signs that were concerning for stroke. So I do definitely think that she's having a stroke. I do think this is a medical emergency, and I think that Mildred should not get up and walk to the neighbor's house to tell them what's going on. She should immediately call 911, and since she lives in the home with her son and, her, and his wife, if they're home, she should alert them uh, to help as well and call 911 if possible. What does FAST stand for? It stands for C, face, arm, speech, and time. And did she have any of the symptoms of, of FAST? So did she have facial weakness? We don't know. Did she have a uh, weakness in her arm? Yes, she did. Did she have trouble with speech? She had slurred speech on the first episode and then came back on the, on the second episode. And so again, it's a medical emergency time is of the essence so 911 should be called Im immediately. So um, in terms of, you guys did great by the way. <laughs> in terms of um, just if you'd like to have more information um, you can visit any of these websites and
American Heart Association and Stroke Association typically have a lot of information as well as the CDC. And also NIH has where we talk about that um, NIH stroke scale. You can actually find um, what that looks like if you want just more information about it on, on that website as well. And that's it for me. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Thank you so much, Dr. Dilla. We have a few minutes, so get your questions going. I saw Ms. Parker's hand raised. I saw Dr. Green's hand raised. So if you guys have a question, feel free. If anybody has wants to write them in the chat, you can do that as well. I just didn't know how to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I don't, I'm looking in the chat to see if I can find anything. Is there a Miss Parker that had a question? Did you I thought that was her hand raised, but maybe oh. that was me too. <clears throat> okay. Well, I just want to thank you all. If there are any questions that pop up, um, feel free to email um, myself or Dr. Dillard. I, de I definitely just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I did, um, I do hope to send a, a uh, survey to the email addresses for everyone that has signed up via Eventbrite. And um, I want to thank Dr. Shaw, who's all on the call, Dr. Haral Shaw. Um, would you like to say a few words since it's our last one today before I turn it over to my pastor? Oh, maybe she left already. So, um, Oh, sorry. Can you hear oh, okay. me? There you go. There you go. Oh, I just wanted to say that was really an excellent talk, and I'm looking forward to more of these in the future. And, um, you know, if there's any specific topics that folks are interested in, also please do let Dr. Mensa know, and we can, you know, look to identify um, experts for those topics as well. So, but thank you so much. This was really great. And thanks, Dr. Dillard. Thank um, you. Thank you for having me. And I want, also want to acknowledge my, acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Lori Quinn, who's on the line. Uh, Dr. Quinn, would you like to have any closing words? No, I would just um, echo Dr. Shaw's uh, comments. You know, we are, are definitely keen to continue these. So if there are um, other topics of interest, um, we would you know, be happy to look for experts in that. And thank you everyone for your support and, and Mia for doing such a great job leading this and thank you, Dr. Dillard. It was incredibly informative. I, I, I learned a lot, so thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. I look forward to more. Thank you, before we close, I see we have a question from Ms. Juliet. If you had a stroke work up, but it was inconclusive and were put on aspirin and astrovastin, what else should you do? If you had a stroke work up and it didn't pan out that there was anything underlying that was concerning, and were put on aspirin and okay. astorvastin. Okay. What else should you do? Um, I would honestly, I think um, if you had symptoms that were concerning for stroke and you had a stroke workup that was inconclusive, um, I would make sure to share that information. If that wasn't done by your PCP, make sure that the, your regular doctor understands that you had these symptoms that were concerning have them take a look at your file for whatever workup you had done, because sometimes not everything is done, right? Like one of the things that um, is, a, is high risk uh, in, in terms of uh, stroke would be underlying like cardiac arrhythmias. And a lot of times a patient will get monitored for those that last for maybe one to two days. And in those one to two days, they don't have any events, but that doesn't mean that next week, they couldn't have all of a sudden have a cardiac arrhythmia that can lead to an em embolic event that causes a stroke. And so <clears throat> these are things that I would make sure that you have someone um, filter through, look and make sure that your workup has been sufficient and, and make sure that that, you know, that physician doesn't recommend any other further workup. I think it's, um, it, it makes sense to put someone on aspirin, on like a baby aspirin every day. And um, a torvastatin, I'm, I'm wondering, maybe this patient has some history with um, cholesterol or, you know, high um, cholesterol or something like that. And they were on, they're on our torvastatin just as a preventive measure as well. But um, I, I think that um, these, these are always concerning when someone has symptoms that are 
that may lead to a stroke down the line. Like we said, a T, if someone has a TIA, they have an increased risk of developing a stroke down the line. And sometimes it's hard to determine if that was a TIA, TIA or not. So it's important, again, I think one of the things that we're talking about in this um, talk is recognizing the signs and symptoms. Making sure that if any of these things happen again, you alert your um, physician, you get, you call 911, you get another workup. Because you never know, sometimes this can be an underlying um, cardiac event or something that just didn't show up on the first workup. So staying on top of it is really, really important. Um, I wanted to add to that. This is um, Hirol Shah. I think, you know, I wanted to echo everything Dr. Dillard said, but unfortunately, you know, that situation where there isn't a cause found is more common than um, we'd like. And it's referred to as a cryptogenic stroke, meaning like a heart where the cause is hard to find. And just as Dr. Dillard said, you know, sometimes during the initial inpatient time, there's a cardiac workup that's done but it's, it doesn't reveal something and a longer monitor is done as an outpatient. But I would say, in addition to what Dr. Dillard said, what's essential is having neurological follow-up. So, you know, seeing your neurologist um, at, after, so sometimes, you know, people have a stroke maybe and they think that now the neurologist has nothing to do for me or nothing that they can offer. But it's a, important to continue to see that neurologist because maybe there is a new test that's available or things change over time. Or as she said, you know, the medications need to continue to be adjusted. Oftentimes the atorvastatin, which is a cholesterol medicine, as she said, is started at a high dose um, during the initial phase of the stroke because it's also thought to reduce inflammation in the brain. And that dose is reduced in the future or would need to be modified depending on what your cholesterol is doing. So ongoing neurological follow-up is critical. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you all. Um, before we go, I'm going to turn over my pasture. But before I do that, I want to thank all of our partners, Teachers College, Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, Impact, St. Luke's AME Baptist Church, Mount Nebo Baptist Church, and Kasudi International. Dr. Erica Dillard is also on the board of directors um, of this organization, this nonprofit organization that provides rehabilitative uh, services, pro bono therapy, and health and wellness uh, lectures and services. So if you have any interest in learning more, you can go to kasudi.org. Thank you, Dr. Dillard. You, this was amazing. I really loved everything about it. And I now turn it over to my pastor, Dr. Johnny Green. Thank you again, Dr. Mincer, for um, inviting Impact and others to be a part uh, of this Brain Health series. Um, it is so vitally important that uh, we know the signs and symptoms of a stroke. And uh, Dr. Erica Dillard has done a fabulous job uh, in her presentation today. Uh, if I was to caricature in one word, uh, what we've uh, witnessed today was just amazing. It was just amazing what the information um, that we have received today in the presentation um, was all of that. And certainly we thank you, Dr. Mincer and Dr. Quinn and Teachers College uh, for putting on such a um, needed uh, series or uh, webinar seminar. Uh, we really, really do appreciate you at Mount Nebo, uh, Dr. Mincer, and we appreciate uh, Dr. Dillard for her um, knowledge and the wealth of information that she has shared with us today. God bless you all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you again, friends from St. Luke. Thank you. Bye, guys.